Welcome to the carnewscafe.com podcast. Good morning, Car News Cafe. This is uh, Nicholas Zart signing in, and we have a few great stories for you today. Basically, a week in recap what happened with uh, Ilio Motors or what is about to happen with Ilio Motors. The Volkswagen Beetle Turbo, it's actually much better than you thought it would be. And Tesla, oh my goodness, Tesla, you are finally there. Must you open your mouth more, much more than you should? Land Rover with a hybrid, what's up with that one? And finally, another interesting segment, but a lot of cars are popping up here and there with 500 horsepower and electric motors. Talks of the Toyota Supra, the Yaris, Yaris 500 horsepower, please tell me more. And finally, my little thing here, uh, the Honda Fit EV test ride. All I can tell you so far is this is day one, and it's a fun little car. Hello, everybody. This is Aaron with CarNewsCafe.com. Like us on Facebook. Click stuff on Google+. Visit us on Twitter. And say stuff. Let us know what you want to hear. Let us know what's going on, what you think. I know a lot of you are big on our Car of the Day and other posts on Facebook, and we really appreciate that. Adam's not here this week. He is at an event promoting his dogs. <laughs> Adam was actually invited to Barking Dogs, which is actually really cool. And we're hoping him all the best because Singing Dogs may be, scoop, scoop, getting a sponsor. And if so, that means that Adam will have more time for us or something. <laughs> We have a lot to talk about today, many cool things. And I'd just like to add, the sponsors are not going to be Card News Cafe because we're still waiting for you to sponsor Earth, just in case, right? <laughs> in case the listeners didn't know this, we entirely bootstrap this ourselves. Car News Cafe is 100% bootstrapped by Aaron, Nicholas, and Adam. Not necessarily in that order because I think, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure who paid for what. <laughs> But we appreciate all of the all of the support we get from people. Yeah, it's actually uh, Aaron, uh, Adam, and Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas just once in a while uses a keyboard, but we still have uh, reservations about that part. <laughs> well, we would get Nicholas Dragon naturally speaking, but it wouldn't improve anything. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. What are you uh, saying about uh, something about my accent? Are you a silly uh, Kinnigut? Listen up, Inspector Clouseau. So today we wanted to talk about a few things. I wanted to start out by talking about the extreme surprise I had for the last week with the 2013 Volkswagen Beetle Convertible Turbo. In my article, which posted Friday morning on this car on uh, Car News Cafe, I called it the poor man's Porsche. And I think kind of sums up the car because I expected it to be, you know, kind of the girly ride. A couple of weeks ago when we first found out that I was going to be getting it, Adam had a lot of fun to poke at me because of the car. And, you know, and I was just trying to imagine how this tiny little convertible was going to fit my six foot three, 240 pounds. And I'll tell you, when I got into this car, within two minutes of having the car, actually it was probably within maybe three minutes because it took me about two minutes to figure out how to open the rag top. <laughs> like most guys, I don't read manuals. But I'll tell you, within just a few minutes of being in this car, I was totally in love with this thing. This is the most fun I have had in a very long time in a test ride where I had certain expectations going into it, and they were totally shattered in the first few minutes that I got in the car. This is a great little car, tons of fun. It has all the stuff you want out of a fun little car. It's totally impractical. It is not a family car. It, it's not really a fuel sipper. It's a kind of a gas guzzler for its size. It has all the impractical stuff that you want when you own a great convertible because it is a convertible sports car. It is made to go fast and get you speeding tickets. Wait a second, Aaron. Are you saying it took you more than a minute to open up the top of a German car and that, gosh forbid, the German car was not practical? What has this world come to? <laughs> There's video um, on Facebook of me opening the top. I threw uh, I threw some porno music in the background because it, it seemed appropriate. But the, uh, the top actually takes a while. And one of my big beefs with this car actually was that it does not have one push open and close on the, to on the rag top. You have to hold the button down. I found that highly annoying because, you know, basically for about 17 or 18 seconds, about 20 seconds, you're sitting there with your hand in the air pushing a button to open and close the top and just very annoying other than that though you can open it up to 30 miles an hour so you can do it while you're on the go you don't have to sit at a stoplight and have people honking at you while you wait for the rag top to finish it's still 
somewhat useful and practical. And then the tonneau cover, the, the windbreak that goes over the back seats, is very easy to install. I, I've, I didn't get any good photos of that, but when you install it, it snaps right into place. It takes like it took me about a minute and a half. Very, very fast, and that was on a first try. So this car, uh, just really quick, here's, here's some numbers that will probably impress the hell out of everybody. From the bottom of the freeway on-ramp all the way to the top, the same on-ramp in the Nissan Altima 3.5 SL, I was able to go about 87 miles an hour from zero to merge on the freeway. In this car, I was at 97 miles an hour, zero to merge, and I have witnesses that were with me. So it wasn't just me in the car. And I was uh, clocked at a quarter mile at 103 miles an hour. So this little car really wants to go. You think about it, it's about a 3,200-pound car, and it has 210 horsepower in output, 200 pound-feet of torque in output. So this is a powerful, powerful little car. It makes awesome little German muscle car noises. The back end is shaped like a Porsche. It has that, that Porsche tail fin and uh, useless trunk and everything else. The new Beetles, by the way, the motor is mounted in, the engine is mounted in the front. Gas tank is underneath the rear seats, which gives it a great balance. German muscle car noise. I'm still res wrestling with that thought. Whew, that's a little too much for me. It's strange, when I first saw the new Beetle, I thought, what the heck are they doing to that poor car? It was such a niche car. It was it had a perfect market segment. And here it is all of a sudden. It's a little bit more squat. It's a little bit more, quote unquote, masculine. But it never really gave me the urge to go and buy one by any stretch of the imagination. However, you're right. The turbo makes a lot of sense according to what you're telling us. Now, we're going to have to go and test drive one ourselves. But I always thought that Volkswagen's missed the spot on that one because it was such a niche car. It had its own segment. It, it was recognizable. And, yeah, it was never a guy's car. And that was perfect the way it is. But I guess maybe this is signs of time where you have to expand every single segments you have to include as many people as you can. What they've done with the car as of the 2013 year is they widened it a little bit, lowered it down a little bit, and then they cut the roof line slightly. So it's it has a little more aggressive look and feel. But it doesn't lose that girly appeal because I can tell you this car is a total chick magnet. Every woman who sees this car wants a ride in it. So it still has that. And it still comes in colors, and it's still marketed towards uh, women, gay guys. And, I mean, they still sell it in the pastel pink. They still have the baby blue color. They still have those things, and they still appeal to those markets. And, in fact, I took it out here to a friend of mine who happens to be gay, and he really liked the car. He said, I won't own one because it's not practical for me. You know, he owns a pickup truck because you know, it's Wyoming. But he said he really enjoyed the car. And he didn't expect that because he said, you know, I always thought of this as a girl's car. And I said, yeah, well, you know. <laughs> That's a little shout out to Matt. I think the true test is I'm going to have to go to my lesbian friends and show them the car and go, what do you think? We'll see. Well, I'll tell you, I also put one of the manliest dudes I know in this car and drove him. And all he had to do was sit next to me and go up that freeway on-ramp from 0 to 97, and he was totally impressed and ready to buy one. So I won't be surprised if his wife, quote-unquote, doesn't get one of these cars. <laughs> the exact opposite of the fun of the Volkswagen is the bullshit of Elon Musk. <laughs> 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 yeah, good old Tesla. It's pretty incredible. Every time you think, cool, yeah, there you go. What the heck is going on with this one? 5.4 star ratings? There is no such thing. It stops at 5. No matter how much freedom you want to take into explaining anything, there's no way you can present it like that. I mean, I think it's very typical. Elon Musk has done that a lot of times before, and, you know, he gets a slap on the wrist, and it goes on, and then it's fine. What's really funny about it is right before this, I was actually starting to write an article, and, and gist of it was, can Tesla do no wrong? And I sort of went through all the things and I said, you know, here's this little startup who all of a sudden modifies this Lotus and, you know, with great, great, great performance numbers, uses uh, off the shelf batteries. All of a sudden their, uh, their next car, a fully home designed uh, model um, sedan, the Model S, beautiful car now has swappable batteries and so I, I don't say you know they keep on throwing one more club in the air in their juggling act and of course now comes the uh, five star uh, rating uh, crash from the uh, NHTSA which is great which is fantastic and I guess it really shows how far uh, t Tesla has come in such a short time but 5.4 seriously I mean I feel sad for Elon Musk in one sense because 
I almost want to go up to him and say, you know what, the days of GM in the 50s and the 60s where they're exuberant marketing and way over the top marketing is well over. People don't really buy into that. And you actually have to be careful because you've got a lot of people cheering for you behind, but you got to mellow out on those kind of things because it eventually does a disservice to uh, to the brand. Teslas are great cars. They're they're probably the best cars on the market in that category. And by the way, I think I read somewhere that they were outselling every other uh, luxury sedan in that segment. Fine, keep it at that. But 5.4 stars, my goodness, there are only five stars. Where are we going with that one? Anyway, I, I think it was a Muskian thing to do again. On the other hand, though, one thing that Elon Musk has always been good at is publicity. And he's good at a lot of things, but he's really good at drumming up publicity. And by that, I mean he is very good at making headlines. And not in a totally negative way, which is pretty amazing given the things that he does. But Musk has a lot of genius behind him. And no, I don't think anybody can argue that. He's a physicist. He has, he's had a lot of dreams that he walked out of high school with and has been busy achieving since. And he's done a lot of great things, but to sum him up, his last name kind of kind of spells it out. He is a musky guy. He is a guy who wants to be in the limelight. If he had a beard and grayer hair, he would be the Doseki uh, spokesman. This is just more of the same. It, it It's funny, I think. I just considered it hilarious because they came out a couple of days ago, two or three days ago, with all these headlines about the Tesla Model S achieves the best safety rating of any car ever tested, sets new NHTSA safety vehicle record, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and then now the NHTSA is coming out and, and calling them on it, which is, you know, just another set of headlines. And every single one of these headlines has Tesla in them. And that's, I think, really what he cares about the most. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, uh, Musk is a brilliant guy, and he does a fantastic job at Tesla. He is the right person for Tesla, and there's no doubt about that. I can see how in, you know, three to five years, they're, you know, he'll probably be pushed away as chairman and take a backseat, and that's perfect. And I think he's probably uh, looking at Steve Jobs and, and reading his biography. But I sort of disagree with your uh, idea of the Dose Kiesman. I, I've seen Musk talk a few times, and uh, he is your typical entrepreneur. He is Quicksilver. He's very fast thinking and you can see how he struggles to slow down his ideas long enough to talk to all these people asking him questions, right? So he's not the best speaker and you, and you can see he still needs a lot of coaching with that. But I think he's the uh, archetypical American dream or the old American dream, the one that's, that's not as easily accessible anymore. But you're right. He came out out of nowhere in high school. He had plenty of dreams and he's done really great. He's done a great job for, for Tesla. But I think also at some point, he also needs to be careful. It's great to uh, drum up uh, business and to get the media all excited. But at some point, naysayers, you know, they eventually say a lot and they eventually will discredit him. And maybe that's the way I look at it. I could be wrong. I'm just one person thinking this after all. But I still think they have to be a little bit careful about what they say, especially 5.4 stars. There ain't so, <laughs> there's no such thing as a 5.4 star <laughs> ratings. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's great. The Tesla Model S is a fantastic car. It crushes things. That's fantastic. There's not an engine in the middle of the, the front hood that can come onto um, your legs and crush them. And we have to give them credit for that. But, yeah, you know, the hyperboles, come on. Here's what I predict, because I think that Musk is exactly what Tesla needed. And he probably still is, at least for the for the near term. I'm going to make a prediction. I'm going to say that when Tesla releases their next model, which will be, I think, next year, right? They're going to debut it. When that next model comes out and finally goes to market, within a year of that, Elon Musk will leave Tesla. He may stay on board in some sort of role, but he will no longer be CEO. And I think that what will happen is Tesla, for him personally, will have lost its luster because it's no now it's a mainstream company, so it will no longer be what he wanted. And he will turn around and he will concentrate on SpaceX. And I expect a more traditional CEO type to then walk in and take over Tesla Motors from there. I think you're right. I think he will step down, and he has to step down at some point or another and become the chairman. But I don't think it's going to be after the Model X. I think it's going to be after the Model E. I think that's the new patent that they dropped for their uh, affordable car. Because if you really look at uh, Tesla's founding wish or founding idea was to have an affordable performance electric car. So I think the Model E might be the one that says, okay, I did what I needed to do. Now I move on. Pretty much like he did with PayPal. And you're right. 
the real drive behind Elon Musk is SpaceX. It's uh, Tesla is a great thing. They've done great. They've done a great job, and he certainly has pushed the envelope very far. But SpaceX is really where it's happening. So he'll go into that. And of course, if you've been following his Hyperloop train technology, linking uh, Los Angeles to San Francisco in about what was it, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, less 30 minutes. So I think this is really where this guy um, excels at. He's he's a brilliant mind. He's uh, he's very quick silver. And, and you're right, he is the right person as a CEO. He's the right person for uh, Tesla, but he will have to step away at, at one point. But I think it's going to happen after that, um, <laughs> quote unquote, economic electric car. It's, what is it, roughly $30,000 or something like that? Something like that. I think he was aiming for a sub 30000 was his goal in today's market. Who knows? Maybe what he'll do is he'll walk away from Tesla and he'll go over and start showing Land Rover how to make hybrids. Yeah, now Sick. what about those wolves? Wow, you know, when we heard about the E-Defender, and for those of you who don't know what the E-Defender is, it was basically an electric Land Rover. I really scratched my head and I thought, hmm, is Land Rover doing that bad that they have to go to uh, to electricity? I mean, Land Rover is the only true SUV around, right? As far as I can see, that's the only real SUV. You can climb up trees. If anybody doubts the efficiency of a Land Rover, just look at the Camel Trophy. That's when you will see burly men cry because they have been tested to the maximum and the cars don't break. Right, so that's fantastic. So when I saw the new hybrid, and by the way, they are selling it. They're going to be selling it on September 10, a hybrid with uh, their diesel V6, I was really impressed. I thought, wow, they're finally there at last. And um, there was also the E Liberty, if you remember well. There was a, another little English company that um, electrified the, the Range Rover. So it's interesting. I think a lot of company do see the writing on the wall that at some point or another, you will need an electric motor. And it's taking some companies much longer than we would expect them to. But the Land Rover with an electric motor, I, I really like that idea. I, I, yeah, actually, I would like to test drive it. <laughs> it's funny because they, they announced this and then immediately took it out for field testing. They're doing a 10,000-mile, 12-country run, right? <laughs> Which to me was, I, I was like, wow, because normally you bring out a prototype you talk about it a little bit. You fiddle around with it in your backyard, you know, at your at your proving grounds on site, so that if it if it falls apart, nobody notices. And then you wait for a year or so, and then you do something like this. But two things about this thing: first off, they're using a very very well proven and uh, an engine they've used for a long time. It's that three liter uh, V6 turbo diesel, and that's a staple engine for Land Rover and has been for several years now, probably about a decade. For Americans, what we should think about is that's about the same engine with the same output that you get when you buy a three-quarter ton pickup truck with a diesel engine in it. It will have that same about three liters turbo diesel V6 engine. Adding to that, they added a 35 kilowatt motor, which is about, what is that, 47 horsepower, 48 horsepower, and a transmission. I don't remember what the transmission is. It was it was fairly high speed. I think it was seven or eight speeds. But uh, the whole hybrid system, including the batteries, is... 120 kilograms, I think, is very light considering. So that makes up for the fact that they put a heavier diesel engine in the truck. That's a, I mean, this is a great combination. One big downer, though, is that when you put a diesel in a car, you add a premium to the car. When you put a hybrid system in a car, you add a premium to the car. When you put both in the car, you add two premiums to the car. Volkswagen said that, and they said that's why we're not doing a diesel electric hybrid. Range Rover can get away with it because they are a premium brand, so they can they can either absorb or add that cost, and nobody will notice, which is, gives them an advantage, and, I, and I'm glad to see they're doing it because diesel electric, in my mind, is much, much better road to take than gasoline electric anyway. I know Nicholas is going to have things to say about that because he's, he's our resident EV guy. <laughs> EV? What does that mean, EV? Elastic velocity, but you're right. It, my my European background uh, always makes me laugh when I think of luxury and diesel. For Europeans, diesel is not luxury. Diesel is the cheapest way to ride a car without spending too much money at the pump. So I'm always laughing when I think of diesel as luxury. But you're right. Diesel makes more sense for hybrids. In fact, if you really think about it, a turbine is the best way 
for a hybrid system or at least a plug-in hybrid system you know the smaller the um, internal combustion engine is the better it is but you're right i think for land rover to put a diesel and a hybrid uh, system together or double premiums if you wish that's probably easier for them to do than anybody else now guess who else is missing from that well that would be the germans the germans actually could easily do that and i'm thinking here more like audi more like bmw more like mercedes these three guys could easily justify that on their suvs but they don't have the same cachet as um, as land rover it, their suvs are more for a round town kind of thing although the mercedes suv is a real suv i think in all for all intent and purposes i'm not an expert on suv i know that you are you're probably much more than i am but i like the idea and on paper that Land Rover looks fantastic. It's not really um, heavy. And by the way, that road you mentioned is none, none other than the Silk Road. So that's interesting because there's a lot of um, historic aspect to that road. Citroën was famous for having crossed that road in the early 1900s with one of those half chains, half wheel cars. And they did, the, again, the Paris uh, Peking uh, route not too long ago, which borrows uh, from the Silk Road. So it's very important for uh, Land Rover to go out there and say it works. Although I, I still kind of question, does their clientele really question hybrid to the point where they have to test out a car like that? I think not. But then again, who knows? I don't buy the uh, Land Rovers. Well, I would say that it's actually a good thing for them to be doing this because people who off-road realize and know that Range Rover is a serious off-road machine for all of its luxury. They are extremely capable. In fact, Range Rover and Jeep are the two companies you think of when you go off-road normally, and they are exactly as capable. I, I don't think you can say one is better than the other. The difference is driving style because the Range Rover will do everything for you. The Jeep requires you to shift a lot of levers and flip a lot of switches. So, you know, it's up to you how to you, how do you want to go off-road? I prefer the levers and switches. This is an amazing machine, though. Sit down and, and think about these numbers. This is a Range Rover. So this is a Rover, a serious off-road machine, putting out 335 horsepower, 516 pound-feet of torque. That is awesome. I don't think you could ever get stuck with, <laughs> with that kind of power. In fact, if you do get stuck, it's because you were spinning the wheel so hard that you dug your own hole because this is amazing. And then add to that, it has the ability to go 0 to 100 kilometers an hour, which is 0 to 62 miles an hour in less than 7 seconds. Tops out at 135. It's, I just looked all this stuff up. It has an 8-speed transmission, and it has a full mile of electric-only driving. So all of that together, think about that, put that together, 44.1 miles per gallon in a full-size, fully capable SUV. Not a BS SUV, a full-size, fully capable off-road machine. That is amazing. Compare that to the just-as-off-road capable Nissan Frontier I was just driving that got a whopping 23 miles a gallon on the highway. Oh, Aaron, you forgot to mention, where are you reading this wonderful uh, story and where are you getting all that stuff from? Could it be from Car News Cafe? It could be from carnewscafe.com. Check out our Land Rover <laughs> to benefit from a hybrid system um, article on Car News Cafe. Better not say it's something else. So I uh, think what we have next is, unless you've been living under a rock, you've seen how all of a sudden we have a flurry of 500 horsepower hybrid performance cars coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> not least of them. A very surprising, and we should say Toyota very well played marketing, a Yaris 500 horsepower superpower hybrid. How in the heck does that work, Aaron? Nicholas, when you wrote this article and I edited it, I don't think I understand what it was I was editing because this did not click in my head. You just you were just now talking about this 500 horsepower Yaris. I thought you were joking because I was like, Yaris, please come on. What the hell? <laughs> it's, it's like a. You know, it's like an entry-level crap little car that, uh, you know, you buy because you're in college and you can't afford anything more than $120 a month in car payment. But uh, you're actually serious. Now I'm reading about this. I'm skimming over this article again, and now it's coming back to me. I'm remembering this. <laughs> it's using this top-end engine that comes with the Yaris as a 1.6 liter. <laughs> and that's exactly what this thing has. <laughs> They're using that tiny little engine. And by the way, you uh, <laughs> will be able to read the entire article on our side with, is Toyota finally serious about hybrid performance? Because yes, we, as much as we love the Prius and we love all these quaint little hybrid cars, hybrid performance, please give us some hybrid performance. The engine I believe they're going to be using in this Yaris, you said it was the uh, European or the, the global platform. The 1.6 liter that they use in Europe 
in the Yaris, the 2Z RFE. And that little engine is actually a little powerhouse of output. It puts out close to 100 kilowatts. So it's um, 134 horsepower. And these are amazing little engines. And they don't bring them to America because they don't meet carb requirements, California Air Resources Board emissions requirements. That's why they don't use that engine here. They use the smaller 1.5 liter. But if they put it into a car and then they add the electric motors, they will pass carb. So that's a good part of the reason why they're able to use that basically race car engine. It's, it's the largest engine, I think, that you could probably physically fit into the Yaris. Because that same engine family goes up to 2 liters, but I don't think you could fit the larger 2 liter bore under that tiny little Yaris hood. This is an amazing idea. Yeah, they're using uh, what they call their global race uh, engine, so 1.6. And, you know, it, it was really funny because same thing. I didn't take it seriously for the past week or so of seeing the little teasers. And strangely enough, if you go back and look at the teasers, tell me what does it remind you of? Well, to me, it reminded me of the BMW i8 efficient vision aerodynamics, uh, you know, this beautifully carved uh, sculptured body and that white and blue stuff. And I thought, what are they doing here? And then I kept on seeing the word Yaris, and I thought, okay, I know they're souping up the Corolla, but uh, what are they going to do with that Yaris? Well, yeah, 500 horsepower in a Yaris. Now, of course, you got to take it with a huge grain of salt here. Um, I don't think Toyota is actually going to produce this, and even if they did, it would be very limited numbers. But remember, it also comes on the heels of Nissan introducing more and more Nismo vehicles. And, well, the, the real story behind it, okay, if you really want to get to it, is there are talks of Toyota wanting to bring back their Supra. And what it is is that Toyota himself uh, really wants to bring back, I think he was quoted saying, sold back into the company, which means obviously the top of the line was the Supra. The Supra was a great car. Now, on these articles that mentioned uh, Toyota bringing back the Supra, they did mention that the new Supra would most likely have an electric motor. While the writing is on the wall, most of these cars will have electric motors, and I'll, I'll make a prediction right here. The next evolution, Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution, will most likely have an electric motor. The Nissan GTR at some point is going to have to get a, a, an electric motor, and so the Supra will. Now, what was really funny was reading the comments. So you obviously always have the old school and the new school, and the old school said, never, I'll never buy a Supra with electric motor. Well, congratulations, don't buy one. That's perfect. Go buy your 90 Supra, soup it up all you want. That's fine. Who cares? Now, there are plenty of people out there who actually want hybrid performance. I'm, I happen to be one of those. I think it's a great idea. You know what I will point out, Nicholas? I will point out the fact that Ford sells the hell out of the Fiesta ST. So why the hell not? Jazz it up, put some funky paint colors on it, throw it into one of the Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious, what are they on, 20 now? Throw it in the latest one. There you go. Exactly, but 500 horsepower in a Yaris? <laughs> Since we're talking about technology anyway, I wanted to quickly talk about Apple throwing stuff into cars now. You did an article on that a few days ago. It was on the 19th about Apple putting Siri eyes in a car. Okay, I think just like everybody else here, let's face it. Infotainments are pretty bad. 80% of them are really, truly bad. And it's not bad as in you should give the car industry credit for what they're doing. This is not their forte. Electronics is not their forte. And certainly computer programming isn't their forte. So it's true that for, for the vast majority of infotainments out there, they're clumsy, they're clunky. It's basically Microsoft versus Apple back in the heydays of the 90s. Just to point out something very simple, I love Siri because I can finally say, call Virginia, it calls my wife, boom, done deal. But you know what? In most other systems, I have to say, they ask you, what command would you like? Call. Calling. Who would you like to call? Virginia, calling Virginia. My gosh, that's four steps instead of click, call Virginia, boom, <laughs> done deal. So, well, and never mind if she has more than one number in your system, too. And if you have more than one number, is that of course it'll, yeah, that's crazy. So, the Siri system in a car would be fantastic. And I think in the article, I talk about how I was always puzzled at how everybody seemed to have gone for either their own solution or, in Ford's case, to rewrite Windows and try to make it fit in a car. And I did ask that question at Ford, and they said, well, frankly said in 2006 or 2007 when they started doing this, Microsoft was the only one available to um, actually work with them. Apple was not interested at the time. Fast forward 2011, and I see a lot of Apple people walking around uh, the LA Auto Show with their little iPads going to manufacturers. And 
of course, I tried to quiz them and, and ask what they were doing. And it was obvious what they were trying to do. But it's, it's late into the game. But as, as always with Apple, uh, it might be actually a very good thing because uh, these infotainments really need to step up their game. And I know it's not their forte for car manufacturers, but it really needs to be a little bit easier than that. And by the way, I also met one of the original guy who worked on, you know, there were two companies that worked on the uh, original Siri project. I met one of them, the one who worked on the smaller company, and he had some very interesting things to say. So we're working on an article here. It should be very interesting. He holds a lot of patents. And his voice recognition, he told me, is light years ahead of anyone. Hmm. More to come. It should be noted that the majority of automakers are using Linux-based infotainment. There are a handful of companies that make those. Most of them are interchangeable, so they are, uh, they're able to talk to each other. That's why when you climb into, say, a, a Toyota or a Nissan, they are very, very similar. Even though the user inter interface looks different, the way they operate is very, very similar. I've always found the Ford MySync, which is the Microsoft version, to be extremely clunky. It's slow. You have to wait to go just between menu items, let alone accomplish something. So I'll be very interested to see if Apple gets into the game what they do with it because infotainment is something that is going to be one of the major changes in car in automotive. You, we're going to see a huge amount of change in terms of how we interact with our vehicles. We're very close to the point now where we will not just talk to the car and say, call somebody or uh, Sirius XM liquid metal or whatever, you know, just tell the car to do things for us. We're also getting to the point where we're no longer going to have to look at menus or look at things because they're either going to pop up in front of us uh, through sort of a Google Glass sort of a interface on the windscreen or they're going to be spoken to us and not in that annoying 1980s the door is a jar the door is a kind of crap and much as i hate the show i'm expecting that inside our lifetimes we're going to have kit cars driving around with you know with the maybe not the little pulsating red light in front but we're going to have that we're going to have that car that talks to us in a normal english star trek style dialogue with the computer car you know so i'm really looking forward to that personally because one of the things i hate about test vehicles is i never know how their stuff works and so i sit in them and i'll spend the first two minutes just looking around and i'll go ah to hell with it stereo on i know how to run sirius good go <laughs> Yeah, I think you're totally right, Aaron. And I think that's one of the things that I also do is when I test drive a car, I try not to look at the manual because A, I'm a guy, I don't like reading manuals, and B, it should be easy enough for me to do. But even for, within one brand, from one car to another, their system is so different that you end up spending a lot of time. You know, yesterday I actually sat down and looked through the manual because I wanted to do the things I wanted to do. And even then it was a bit clunky. So I think that's the uh, promise Apple is probably going to deliver is we'll be able to communicate with our car, not just tell it to do certain things. However, in Ford's defense, I, I have to say I found out something which sort of endears me to them is up until last year, there were only, as they said, two and a half people working on the, the sync program. So if you think about it, in five years, those two and a half people did a lot of work. This year, I think they have uh, 10, 14 people working on it. So it, we should see uh, some great improvements. But again, the improvements should be, let's walk away from step-by-step -step, um, operations of the system. It needs to be some sort of AI, some sort of uh, artificial intelligence. So that is probably the uh, promise that Apple is, is going to deliver on us. Speaking of uh, impractical things, uh, you seem to have an article that's been picking a lot of interest here. What is this thing about Elio Motors? I did a video review of the Elio Motors three-wheeled car, which has really taken off on YouTube. It's our most trafficked YouTube uh, video by far, and it's gotten a lot of good compliments, which I'm proud of. I'm glad of that. But since I made that video in a couple of months since then, some things have come to light about the company. And a few days ago, on the 21st, I did an article about how Elio was trying to secure this General Motors plant in outside of Shreveport, Louisiana. And they paid a large deposit, it was about $750,000, to put a hold on it so that they would have first dibs to buy. But they have to make the full payment, they have to fully purchase it by September 4th. And in order to do that, they were going to have to come up with somewhere between seven and a half and $10 million. And for whatever reason, which in my article on the 21st, Elio Motors may get a grant for assembly plant purchase. I said, for whatever reason, they are not able to raise that kind of money to buy the plant. I found that very hokey 
because a mere ten million dollars to buy a physical something that is security on the loan, it seems funny to me that they can't accomplish that. They can't just go to somebody or even go to a bank and say, look, we need this much money to buy this. So as I originally wrote the article, I just wrote that they were approaching the parish, which is actually the town that is around that plant of Cato. And they were asking for, or Cato, I think is how you pronounce it, and asking for a handout, basically, a government handout to buy this facility Yet with the promise that they're going to create 1,500 jobs by doing so. And the commission wanted to do this but they legally can't just buy something and hand it to them. And they can't legally invest in a startup. So they had to come up with kind of a convoluted roundabout way to do it. And so their solution was to buy the company from the holding company that owns it now. There's a trust that owns it now that was created when GM closed the plant and uh, declared bankruptcy. And that trust owns the property and has to sell it by a certain point. And so they bought it from them through a holding company. The holding company will then lease it to a property management company in California. That property management company will then turn around and lease a portion, about half of the facility, to Elio Motors and then sublet the rest to others. Right off the bat, that made me wonder. And so I sat down and I did more research. I wrote that article and then I sat down and I dug and dug and dug. And what I found was, and what a lot of other people have found it all the same time, because what happened was in order to get the Cato Township to put in, or the Cato Parish, to put into this fund, Elio had to give them financial information, including not only current, but future, how they plan to make the money back, how they plan to get 1,500 employees, et cetera, et cetera. And that became public knowledge at that point, right? Because it goes to a public entity, it becomes public knowledge. I found the documents through a simple Google search. And let me tell you, these guys are, I mean, it's not even, I, wouldn't, I won't even call it masterful dreaming because it's so obvious that they're full of crap <laughs> that it's just dumbfounding that they that not only would they would think of that it it surprises me not at all by the way that the Cato Parish fell for it and signed on to the deal uh, as of last night and are going to front them the money it that doesn't surprise me at all because I never expect government to make sense but what surprised me is that they put this out there and didn't expect anybody to ask them any question think about this they're going to be building cars and their profit at the manufacturing level is going to be $1,000 per car. That's not horrible considering these are less than $8,000 to start with, right? Your MSRP is under $8,000. But they need $200 million to get these cars to fruition. So from now to next year when they plan to actually start building these cars, they have to somehow raise $200 million. Now, their thought is, is that once they have a manufacturing facility, the money is just going to come flying at them. They're going to be able to do it. Putting that aside, where they're going to get $200 million, then you have to sit down and you have to say, wait a minute, that's going to be about $250 million in total that they're in the hole just to get started. At $1,000 per car, they have to sell 250,000 cars to make that $250 million back, right? 250,000 cars, they say they're going to be able to do in the second or third year. Well, wait a minute. This is with a three-wheeled two-seater, okay? 250,000 total cars is about how many Toyota Corollas and Honda Civics are sold in this country each, okay? That's one model, and those are base-level sedans, best-selling models in the country. So basically, the Elio would have to become the best-selling model in the country, or at least one of the top five. I don't see how this is going to do this. And then that's just the start. I mean, the... the you get into their dealership model and all this other stuff. It is totally hoax. I mean, it's just horrendously, it's very obviously that the people who put this together have never worked at a car dealership, don't know anything about how vehicles are sold or maintained or offered in this country, have no idea how uh, supply networks work, have no clue how any, any of this stuff is supposed to come together. It's just once you sit down and you look at this, it just makes no sense, and suddenly all any faith I had in this company is totally gone. I would love to see this car made, but I don't think they're going to do it. Go ahead, Nicholas. What did you have to say? You've been shaking your head the whole time. I know you're disappointed. Well, uh, yeah, it is disappointing. It is, I mean, disappointing at least on paper. I think what we really should be doing is we should uh, reach out to uh, the, how do you pronounce it, Cato Parish, and give them a little uh, history briefing of what happened in Iceland. Maybe that might shed some light as to what could probably happen to them. Although I doubt that people would actually uh, throw stones at them. Uh, we're much too docile. <laughs> 
Well, I can't remember the name of it, but there was actually an American car company back in the 70s that had a three-wheeled car that was trying to do something during the uh, oil crisis. I don't remember all the details. It's vague, but I remember it from history anyway. And as you just pointed out, indeed, yes, there have been a lot of three-wheeled cars uh, through the history of our automobile history. And there are still some that are still manufacturers. Myers, I think, is probably the best candidate out there. But Myers is an electric car. They sell very little of them. They're good little cars. They're mostly on the East Coast, but they don't get anywhere near that kind of number or those kind of numbers. So it's, yeah, it's puzzling. It's a little uh, confusing. And what can you say? I think everywhere you look these days, the, the news is just dumbfounding. And it really makes you wonder. There's nothing much common about common sense anymore. Also, you have to consider something very basic here, and that is that Elio Motors started in about uh, 2006 or 2007. When they began, they were actually in the Detroit area, and they were actually promising to build cars there. And for whatever reason, they backed out. Since the beginning in 2007, they have been, quote, 18 months, unquote, away from building their car. So, you know, now it's 2013, and they're still at least a year away from building it. You know, it's a little bit hokey. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons that they left Michigan that didn't necessarily have to do with Elio being questionable. I think it had also to do a lot with Michigan's labor laws and the requirements to buy a facility there that they were trying to get into, which was another GM plant. And also just the plant itself, I don't think was what they needed. I, there was a lot going on. It was, wasn't just Elio at that point. But it should be noted that in 2007, they were 18 months away from making a car. It's 2013. They are 18 months away from making a car. So I, as much as I would love to see this awesome, cool little car be made, I, I just don't see it happening. On the flip side of that, there's another company that, that is uh, very similar but took a completely radically different route and has done awesome things on the level of Tesla and that is a company called Local Motors. And they're based out of Arizona now. And they make a car called the Rally Fighter. It's an off-road rally machine. The cool thing about them is that, unlike Elio, they have never taken a dollar from any government entity. All of their money was either bootstrapped or invested by other people, by private enterprise. And they're selling the hell out of these little, I mean, they're $100,000 premium off-road machines. It's called the Rally Fighter that they build. They just built a motorcycle, which is right now in Sturgis. But the cool thing is, is the way they do it. They call it local motors because if you live in New York, then they figure out how to set up shop and they come to New York and they build it for you there. And you go and build it. If you can get two or three of you to build it, you don't have to fly out to Arizona. They'll come to you. And the way it works is you put your hands on it while you are there while it's being built. And because of that, because you're part of it, you get the... Ooh, that's my kind of car, my kind of car company. I like that. That's true. Uh, put your money where your mouth is and uh, show me your wallet kind of thing. Now, let's throw something else on top of that, Nicholas. I know you'll love this. Do you know where all their designs and things come from? They are 100% crowdsourced. They have des a design community of, of designers, kids and, and amateurs and whatever else, and they hold contests. And they designed something like this motorcycle they just did. They did a thing for Peterbilt. They did one. They did the ultimate pizza delivery machine for Domino's, stuff like that. And what they do is they pull this community together and they hold crowdsourced competitions. And the crowd votes. So they put in all these things. The crowd votes for the finalists. And then they decide the, the winners. And everything is off the shelf. On the Rally Fighter, they build the chassis, they build the framing, and they build the body. The engine, the powertrain, the door handles, the headlight bezels, all that stuff is off the shelf at your local parts store. So they're using like a, in the Rally Fighter, they're using the General Motors powertrain. So you can go to any Chevy dealership or any AutoZone or whatever, and you can get parts for it. It's amazing the ideas that they have and the things that they're doing, and it's, it, it's a great company. And Elio had the ability to do that and never did and should have. There are a lot of others who have tried and failed, never gotten anywhere either because they think too much like the current paradigm of automotive. And the current paradigm of automotive only works if you are already in the current setup of automotive. If you are already Ford, General Motors, and whoever, then it works. But if you are not, if you are brand new, five people trying to build a car and sell it, you have to go completely different. You have to think out of the box. Local Motors got around a lot of even though they meet all the tr crash test requirements and they did do all of that stuff with the rally fighter, they get around all the registration laws. 
because it's considered a kit car because you go and hands-on build it. The guy who started it's a Marine, and he said, first thing I had to do is figure out how to adapt and overcome. And he said, we have all these laws in place. I had to figure out how to get around them because I can't afford to spend $100 million just to establish myself, uh, the, all these licensing and whatever other, other requirements. So instead, I just went around them. Uh, that's how you have to think in today's world in order to get somewhere if you're starting from nothing. Yeah, definitely my kind of company. And by the way, also another industry that's uh, experiencing a great shakeup is the movie industry and also the TV industry, where a lot of the new movies right now are being crowdsourced and, you know, Kickstarters and everything. And by the way, even for what we like to do, or at least what I like to do, a lot of filming and a lot of interviewing and a lot of filming cars, a lot of people are walking away from uh, network channels who eventually screw them over and start their own systems and start their own production centers. So I'm, I'm talking to a few of these people and I'm finding that innovation is well and alive in the U.S. It just ain't where you're looking at. So um, speaking of this, I think it might be time to start wrapping up here. I wanted to talk quickly about my test car of the week. I thank you, Honda. I got a Honda Fit EV for seven days. I've already had my first day with it. And I briefly drove the Honda Fit EV at the Los Angeles Auto Show in 2012. I wasn't completely sold with it. And the reason was that the front suspension felt loose, didn't feel very precise, felt like it had a lot of oversteer and over torque, strangely enough. No, I'm sorry, understeer and over torque. So I thought, well, this is really strange. This is not what I expect from Honda. But Having said this, well, yesterday when I went to pick up the car, I saw two BMW Active E, and I asked what were they doing there, and they were saying, well, they're being shipped back to the motherland. So I went online, and I, you know, posted the picture, and I said, sniff, sniff, you know, these ladies are leaving, broken hearts behind, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, I thought, I have a friend who actually has an Active E. I wonder if that's not one of his. So I called him up, and we talked, and he let me drive his Active E, which, by the way, is one of those cars I had never driven before. <laughs> and I thought, before it's too late, I should kind of uh, reach out to someone. So I test drove, and making a long story short, believe it or not, I test drove it. It was, it was fun. It was definitely a BMW, a little bit on the heavy side, but really great for that kind of car. Sensational regenerative braking, the way you like them. You know, this is not your Nissan Leaf or Ford Focus electric kind of regenerative braking. This is a man's <laughs> braking system. Your regenerative brakes almost to a stop, and I love that. So back to the uh, Honda. The Honda Fit EV, after spending a day, and I was a little bit late going to see my friend. I had it in sports mode. Wow, let me tell you, that was fun. That car brought a smile on my face. It is zippy. It handles actually quite well once you get used to that very light steering sen sensation. And it, it's a really fun car. And uh, as we go into the next few days, I'll talk about, you know, the rest of the car, living with a car for a whole week and everything. It's too bad it's a compliance car, although it's um, obvious they're using it as a test ground. And uh, so far, I've got to say it's a pretty cool car. Well, that's pretty awesome because that's one car that I have never driven. I've never driven a Fit or the Fit EV. So it'll be interesting to read what you have to say about it and to hear about it maybe next week because... Uh, that's a car that I have known about on the peripheral but have never had any hands-on with. So that's pretty exciting. Are they selling that only in California or is it is it going national? Yeah, don't quote me yet, but I, I really think it is only leased. for. I mean, it is for sure only leased, so you can't buy it. And it is a Californian car. I think it might be in Oregon. I don't remember. But it's an important stepping stone in the EV community because it was one of those cars that after this GM Spark EV came onto the market at close to $20,000 after incentives, a Honda was the first one to react and lower its leasing. So I think the car went from something like crazy, like $350 a month to now it's not $200 a month. But... Honda gives you a charging station, a level two charging station, which you get to keep. So there's a nice little war right now. And I think really boils down to the Spark EV, the Fiat 500e, and the Honda Fit EV. And the last two are compliance cars. Well, actually, the Spark is also a compliance car. They're all compliance cars, really, <laughs> except for the Mitsubishi iMeve and, and a few others like that. But hey, great first step in the right direction. If anywhere has the population density to handle, well, to have enough people that would be interested in an electric car, it's going to be California. Because a lot of most places in this country outside of California are not population dense enough for there to be a large enough market of people that will be interested in a battery electric car because of the range limitations and so on and so forth and the, everything that comes with that. Even though a large percent of the, of the population can use the car, 
they can only use it for the majority of their driving, not all of their driving. Yeah, I think it's 80% of the population can drive any electric car for their daily commute. But you're right. I think the, the perceived notion of limited range, and it's true, once in a while you do want to go somewhere else, you don't want to have to worry about. But it's still, if you think about it, it's still cheaper to rent a car. But that, that's another topic. And you're right. I think California is the best way to do it. Thanks for listening to the CarNewsCafe.com podcast. Come visit us and like us on Facebook. Like us, like us, like us, like us a lot. And uh, let's see, what else have we got, Nicholas? We've got Google Plus. We've got SingingDogs.net. We've got... (laughs) (laughs) And just one final note, I would like people to notice on the website that Nicholas added a press release section. That is because one of our biggest pet peeves with other automotive sites that we write for or read is that they often just regurgitate PR. And that is the most annoying type of writing to do as a journalist, to just sit down with a press release and regurgitate it, you know, reword it or whatever. What Nicholas came up with and what we decided was a great solution was, why not just reprint the press release? Because it was interesting, even though we don't really plan to do a story or maybe we're going to do a related story and we like to, to reference it. So that's something that we've added to the site. You're not going to see just a feed. It's not going to be just a feed of stuff coming from an automotive company or whatever where it just starts blasting it with stuff. It's going to be stuff that we think is interesting or relevant and that fits with what we're doing because most of what we are writing is more editorial. We're not doing news news. We're doing news from with a perspective. We're giving our perspective on the news rather than some editor somewhere or some it's news from an automotive journalist who's an enthusiast first and that's why we encourage that if you have something that you want to hear about you let us know or if you want to write about it you come to us and write about it we have a guest blogging program we have we have set up so that if you want to eventually build your own blog and your own following we can help you do that we're happy to do that Because we think the more voices there are out there, the better things are. And we really, really want to get away from this current paradigm that's just based on the old outmoded print press ideal where you get a press release, you go to an event, they schmooze you for a while, they give you a bunch of free stuff, and then you go and you sit down and you write a glowing, happy, happy, everything's good, joy, joy article about this car that sucked. And and you have no repercussions for that and nobody's the wiser. We're trying to change that a little bit, at least for us and for the people who enjoy what we're doing. And so we would like you to come to us and tell us, what do you think, what do you want to see? I was going to say 50,000 hats and three people holding them. That's a good job. Car News Cafe. Like us on Facebook at Car News Cafe. Like us on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn. Google Plus, if you are into electric cars and the EV community, there's a really strong following of bright-minded fellows out there. and. I don't want to say I'm part of them, but I'm definitely very active. (laughs) But it's uh, Google Plus is a lot of fun. And of course, Twitter, like us, let us know what you think. Let us know what you're doing. As Aaron said, we are a three-man show. We pocket everything ourselves. We do get cars uh, because they're loaned to us, but everything else is ourselves. We pay for everything. We pay for our microphones. We pay for our hosting. We pay for our websites. Unfortunately, I never paid for my writing classes, which obviously shows. But hey, you know what? I think I'm better on camera anyway. Um, But like us. Let us know what you think. Ask your friends to read us because it means a lot to us. It means that we can finally get uh, advertisers and we can give you even more relevant and quality content. And come on, seriously, we're here because we're sick and tired of how the news is handled out there. We're sick and tired because we're not SEO machines and we're not fancy title designers. We talk about what passions us, what makes you passionate about cars, straightforward, straight communication about cars and why they're so much fun and why they're important. So like us, like us, and like us. Did you get the message? Like us. Seriously, do it. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. This is Nick Lazard and signing off for Car News Cafe. Well, for carnewscafe.com, this has been Aaron. We'll talk to you soon. See you next week. Ha <laughs> ha, and whatever. Uh, 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 edit, edit.